In this video, I'm going to teach you how to inspect GDNT symbols. Uh, GDNT stands for Global Dimensioning and Tolerancing, and it's a very important topic in inspection and metrology, as well as manufacturing and design. It helps us control features through a different type of tolerancing system than our standard plus or minus rectangular tolerance zones that you see on typical title blocks and attached to uh, different uh, different callouts on a blueprint. Now, GDNT is is a is a very complex and long topic. It's really more than I can cover in in one video. And I've decided to really just focus on how to use the gauges to inspect to the symbols, and how to interpret the symbols on a blueprint. So. Uh, before we get started, um, you should probably go to the website pragmaticmetrology.com and download a few of these drawings that I'm going to be using throughout this video. This video will be a little bit different than my other videos where I broke up sort of an introduction to the tools and then walk you through an exercise in another video. Since there's no new tools to cover, we're going to do the exercises and the discussion in the same video. So you want to grab these, uh, grab these blueprints before we get started so you can follow along. It'll make it easier. And if you want to, you can follow along if you want to 3D print this part or make this part yourself, as well as the angle block and our flange. So I'll have all these 3D models up on the website. So uh, follow along or grab your own parts and blueprints if you want to. It's up to you. Uh, so, uh, well, let's just get started. So, uh, these are the symbols that uh, define GD&T. These are actually just um, just the main symbols uh, for each type of, of control. And when we're talking about these symbols, we're actually talking about error. So, we're talking about form error, straightness, flatness, circularity, and cylindricity. Uh, basically, you know, straightness, how straight is something, and that and the error would be how out of straight is it? Circularity would be you know how circular is it? And the error is how out of circular is it? So we're always all of these are talking about error, location error, orientation error, run out error, profile error. And there's a few more symbols uh, that go along with this that we're gonna we're gonna introduce a few of them, but we're gonna really we're gonna really focus on these. We're gonna get started with the basics and. When you feel more comfortable with GDNT, read up on the modifying symbols and, and all the other symbols associated, but these are the main ones you really need to know. And you should memorize these and keep a chart close by. There's a lot of great references out there on the internet and in books. Um, if you want to reference ASME Y14.5 uh, 2018, that is the latest revision that controls these symbols. And you know, this, the, the purpose of these symbols, as I said, is control our, our features with a different style of tolerance zone, but it's also to communicate functional tolerance. So all of these symbols are going to be applied to the critical features, whether they're critical for performance, critical for assembly, um, and, and also critical for manufacturing. So sometimes we'll apply, for example, a flatness tolerance so that manufacturing keeps the part flat throughout the process, it gets to the assembly process, and, and it goes together exactly as intended. Sometimes if that surface isn't held flat at the beginning of the assembly of the manufacturing process or throughout, some of the other symbols, uh, sorry, some of the other features will end up out of position and it won't work for assembly. So you'll see sometimes prints have a production uh, requirement on it it may not necessarily translate to the part function, but for the most part, I'd say 95% of the symbols I see relate to some way that the part is going to function within the whole assembly that it's going to. And before we uh, before we sort of jump into it, I do want to say, you know, GD and T is a, as I mentioned in the beginning is a very complex topic, and there is a lot of debate on what these symbols mean, what they're, how to interpret them, how to apply them, how to machine them, how to inspect them. There's debate all across the board. And I'll say a lot of the, a lot of the documentation, a lot of the books, 
the ASME standard, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the information on the internet, it really is focused on applying the engineering requirements correctly. It's about defining what is flatness, what is cylindricity, and how to properly apply it to a blueprint. But there's really not a whole lot of material that I've seen on, on how to inspect it. You know, so a lot of times, yeah, people can, oh yeah, I know exactly what this symbol means, but how do you inspect it? How do you measure it? So we're gonna focus on that. But as I said, a lot of the, a lot of the documentation you'll find will be on the definition of the symbols, how they should be applied. And I wanna make another comment. Um, throughout my career, I've worked at uh, several companies and, and, and going to school, you see these GD and T symbols and there's very little standardization in how they've been applied, at least in my experience and, and the experiences of people I've talked to. Even though there are standards out there, you know, the standards give a lot of really good examples, but it's always a lot of widgets. It's always a lot of parts that don't really translate to what companies are making. So what ends up happening is people get these more complicated parts and they have all levels of experience. Maybe they've had training, maybe they haven't. Maybe they've read the standard, maybe they haven't. And so there's a wide variety of gd &T symbols being applied, you know, correctly, incorrectly, could be better, could be worse, you know. I very rarely come across a print that uses a lot of gd &T and has no errors. I frequently find, well, errors is maybe a, a harsh way to put it, but I frequently find opportunities for improvement where the gd &T symbol is the wrong symbol, should be a different one, or the tolerance has been applied incorrectly in the gd &T, the new gd &T format. So uh, just keep that in mind. That's one of the sources of all this debate I've talked about. You can get five people together, they won't agree on on the symbol that should be used or the tolerance that should be used or how it should be machined or how it should be inspected. I, I've never had that happen in my career. So um, I feel confident in, in what I'm gonna teach you. I'm gonna try to teach you um, in, in the direct application of these symbols. If you wanna talk to some people and get uh, some more feedback, I, I de definitely recommend it because I, I've arrived at my current state uh, of gd &T knowledge just by talking to people getting their opinions on what they think is right. And, you know, the truth is almost everybody has a little bit of, uh, is a little bit correct and a little bit wrong. I've been wrong. Other people have been a little bit wrong or better than me and, and taught me some things. And I'm going to try to teach you some of that as we go through, again, the application of the inspection, because I feel like that's one area that's a little bit weaker than the application of the engineering requirements. So uh, before we get into the measurement, we have to actually know what we're inspecting, of course. As I always say, we want to inspect to the print. And I want to give you guys a visual idea of what gd &T does. So when you look at a typical blueprint, your, your tolerance, you know, your step, um, your flange step, 3.210, you have a plus or minus five thousandths, your overall thickness, is on here one inch plus or minus five thousandths. Um, you have a through hole 0.375 plus five tenths minus nothing. So these are standard tolerances. But what the GD and T symbols do is they kind of override and make those tolerances obsolete, null and void. You can pretty much just ignore them. Uh, forget the fact that maybe there's a one inch position Plus or minus, you might think, yeah, it's plus or minus five, but actually you have to look at your position symbol, uh, which looks like this one here, and you end up applying a completely different zone uh, for, for all of these symbols. So when you're looking at a print, you can, you can use those numbers for locations and sizes as references to what the nominal should be, and that will help you set up your gauges and pick the right tools, but the tolerance shouldn't be the title block tolerance. The tolerance is gonna be along with the symbol. And these are what the symbols look, uh, these are what the, the tolerance zones look like. There's basically two applications. You can either have a circular tolerance zone, which works for circularity, runout, uh, cylindricity, and total runout. 
all of those tolerance zones are circles. You have a, a small circle that represents your minimum. You have a large circle that represents your maximum. And then you have that zone in between where your surface should be or your diameter should be. Um, that pos true position in the middle here, I have a little asterisk here because true position doesn't quite act like the other symbols, but it does have a circular tolerance zone, which I will, I will talk about more when we specifically talk about true position. True position uses a circular tolerance zone, but it only has a maximum. It doesn't really have a minimum. So uh, that's one difference from, from these others, but it is so, still circular. When you're talking about the linear and the planar zones, you know, we're talking about how straight is something, how flat is something, how parallel is something from one surface to another, how perpendicular is it, and, and, or at, once, at one specific angle like we have on our angle block. So all of those are, you know, you have a, you have a maximum and a minimum tolerance where your plane or your line should be. And so, it's, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, don't think about those standard tidal block tolerances you used to have because this is what you do have whenever you see these symbols. It's one or the other in, in most applications. Uh, what I don't have on here is profile and of a line and profile of a plane. Uh, you could say those are uh, similar to the linear planar type um, tolerances. It's basically if you have a, a complex sort of curve that, that your machining needs to, to follow and maintain a profile, well you have a plus or minus zone to remain within. It won't just be straight, it could be a trap shape, it could be any, any shape. And, a, and the planar version of that would be a 2D surface that maybe has hills and valleys, uh, maybe an impeller that profile that you need to follow. So I won't be covering that symbol, those two symbols in this video, mostly because there's really not a good way to do those symbols without a CMM. There's not a good way to do it with hand tools or surface plate tools. So you really just need a CMM, which is not something I have uh, to show you right now. But um, these other symbols you can do with the hand tools and the surface plate tools with no issue. Um, they're very, once you know what you're doing, uh, you can handle them pretty easily. So next up, you know, we're going to start breaking down how you interpret the GD&T callouts. And the first thing you want to do is you want to look on your print for something called datums. So these datums are sort of reference zeros for the GD&T symbols. So if you have a position from datum A, you look for where datum A is, and then you position yourself from that zero point. Uh, datums are necessary for many of the symbols, but not all of them. Uh, pretty much the, the form error symbols, they're not required because form error is only talking about shape of itself. It, it has no relation to a positional datum. So straightness and flatness, circularity and cylindricity are just how out of round or how out of flat, how out of straight are they? When you look at a print, it's typically going to look like this, although every software is different and throughout the years um, there have been different um, versions of, of software and datum symbols, but you'll typically see a dark triangle attached to one of these surfaces with a leader coming out and then a box around a letter. That's how most datums are, although different prints will have different styles, so you'll just have to get used to your version. For all the prints we're going to look at, they're going to be in this style here. And they should be attached to surfaces. If you see them attached to center lines, that is one of those areas that um, should not happen. But oftentimes when engineers are trying to portray or communicate functional design, for them it's easier to define it on a center line. But datums should be all surfaces. We need surfaces for what we're doing. We, don't, we can't use center lines, which are uh, out in space somewhere. So. Um, keep that in mind. Uh, datums sometimes will look like, um, they, might, they might not always be, I should say, um, we're gonna, I'll show you a symbol that, that's slightly different than this. You'll see um, a typical leader, typical arrow leader 
with a datum symbol at the, at the end of it. And sometimes that's so you can identify the datum and the size of the datum in the same leader. So I'll show you one version of that uh, throughout these slides. I'll, I'll make sure to stop on that. Now next up we have the feature control frames, which if you look at the PMO2 in the bottom right corner, uh, we've got the, the feature control frame for the true position symbol. Um, and this is, when, when you learn how to read this, you learn how to read your tolerance. So it looks like a rectangle and there will be different sections. The first section is always the symbol. So one of those 14 original symbols I showed you, position, flatness, parallelism, whatever. Next up, you'll have your tolerance. And this is a total tolerance. This is another key feature. This is not a plus or minus 14. This is the size of a tolerance zone. Actually, since it's a circle, it's the diameter. In this case, it's a diameter of 14 thousandths. If it were a parallel, if I put a parallelism, parallelism symbol there instead, it would be a zone 14 thousandths wide. So it would be like the distance between these two purple planes would be the representation of my tolerance zone, 14 thousandths. And for my position symbol, um, we'll talk about position later so I don't confuse you. But um, this is what it looks like. Now you may have a modifying symbol. We're not going to go too deep into modifiers, but uh, when we talk about true position, I will, I will discuss them a little bit. They basically, if they're there, you know, grab a reference book and look up what they are if you, you know, if you don't, if you're not sure. They're very straightforward. This is a maximum material condition, which helps you um, get bonus tolerance, get you more tolerance. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, when we talk about true position. And then the next section is you'll have your datum references. So what we talked about on this slide um, right here. So these are datums A and C. This is calling out true position A, B, and C. So when we're, when we're measuring this true position, we need to recognize where A, B, and C is and make our tolerance zone in relation to those datums. Now I know for, I know already this symbol, this, uh, this feature control frame is attached to this hole. So I have a nominal 2.5 inch from this corner and I have a nominal, uh, it looks like a half inch. If you check the print, it's a little bit cut off here. So I'm, I'm, those are my nominal values. And then I have a 14 thousandths diameter around it. Now you have to be careful because sometimes what, what prints are not supposed to do is reference, you know, I, I have uh, on this part, I have the datums A and B and C so all of my dimension leaders come from those features. Now, occasionally you'll see a dimension leader come from the opposite side and define a whole location and they'll apply a 14 thousandths relative to that. And that makes it a little tricky because of tolerance stack up, you're coming off of an uncontrolled surface that's not a datum. That makes things a lot trickier. So you need to do the shot math to figure out what the nominal would be if the symbol were off of the proper datum, but um, that's a that's a big discussion for another time. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you, if the print is good, hopefully your datums and your leaders for nominals will match up. But oftentimes, if this 2.5, if that whole location had been defined from this edge, and let's say it was 1.5 inches, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it could be 1.5 inches. I could have uh, put a 1.5 from here to here. I would need to actually figure out 2.5 from from this edge. So, and that, that that's important when you actually do the measurements. So getting a little bit ahead. Um, now datum hierarchy, it um, it's a little bit important, although I haven't seen this applied to great extent, but your, your datum A is usually your primary datum B is your secondary, and datum C is your tertiary. And these are in, defined in order of importance. So if you have a part such as this, this block here, and it's mating up to another surface with some bolts, and maybe that, that assembly process is really critical, you would call that datum A, 
then maybe there's some other features for the other datums that are assembling with it. You call those B and C. They're less important than the initial contact. Uh, another good uh, example might be with a, with a shaft. Oftentimes, uh, one of the faces is critical, but one of the diameters is also critical, and you get to choose. Is it more important that the face is a datum, primary datum, or is it more important that some of the diameters are? And that can go back and forth. Uh, typically, I would expect that if it's a turn part with critical datums and critical diameters, the diameters would be more important as a datum than the face. That's not always the case. So uh, keep that in mind. And as, I, as I've said before, you have to inspect to the print you have. So uh, feel free to ask questions about changing prints, but in the end, you, you do need to inspect to the print you have. Now, why this is important, if you, if you have a, a, a part like this with an ABC uh, datum, let me, uh, I'm going to flip over to the camera now. If my A datum is this face, my B datum is this long faced, and my C datum is my long face, when we're setting it up on the rock and taking certain measurements, depending on which datum we're talking about, we will change our setup based on the primary, secondary, and, and tertiary datums. So we call this the 3 2, 1 method. And I'll walk you through it with, with the part as it sits right now. So it basically means register on three points, then register on two points, then register on one point. And when you do that, you have fully restrained your part so that you can actually take measurements with your tools, moving them around, and it won't affect your measurements. So if I did a 3, 2, 1 on this, um, on this part here, data A is the back surface, and I would like to put that on my rock to get three points. It's going to self-level on three points. Datum B here is my secondary uh, datum. So I'm going to grab a one, two, three block. It's not typically heavy enough to be considered a good uh, datum surface. And maybe it would be an angle block or a much larger two, four, six or two, four, eight block. But at this point, we talk about I'm completely unrestrained in all these axes. But if I slide it up against the one, two, three block, I can no longer rotate because I am restrained here. And all I can do is slide in and out. So I have one more axis of motion left over. I'll, I'll use this other one, two, three block as a simulation. And when it touches there, um, my part's finished. Now, a lot of people take this process for granted, and that's because they take a look at their part and they, it looks smooth, it looks perpendicular. Uh, in reality, you know, when you're talking about these surface imperfections, if you take a look at you know, the standards for GD&T, the standards for datums and such, whenever they draw a part like this, they're going to draw it with really rough surfaces because, you know, we don't know exactly how great this surface is. Even though it looks great, we have to treat it as though it might be different. And when you put it down, you know, on a surface plate, you know, we can, we can replicate our, our same, oops, button hole. We can represent our, our same block, but when we, when, we, when we need to register it, maybe on this point and this point for our second datum, and then let's say our, our third point is out here, this may not be, you know, this will be um, a 90 degree angle, but if you were to flip this around and use different points, and, and do two points over here and one point over here, it actually is not always going to be the same angle because you have imperfections. And it might be that, you know, if I, if I exaggerate the issue, if I, if I exaggerate this a tiny bit, in this orientation, my 3, 2, 1 ends up just like this. 
But if I decide, oh, hey, you know what? I want my two side to be on this one. And now I can slide this up and down. Just for visual representation. Actually, this might be a, this might be a better visual. Um, it could be really exaggerated, but out of skew. Um, so the moral of the story is follow, you know, follow this, just follow the datum order if you can. And one thing that can get tricky when we go to inspect these holes, um, oftentimes people will just rest it on datum B and do all their work. And datum A might be, you know, important for the, for some of the work. So what people should do is, you know, grab some sort of block and clamp it on, clamp it on and then drop it down and let it self-center on two points. But your third, your three points should be, should be this direction so that it's not tipping one way or another on the bottom surface that in fact, it will be perpendicular no matter what condition the bottom surface is your part when it, when it registers down is going to be perpendicular. Cause you could have a very severe taper on one side that when it's loose, causes it to sit at an angle. No, I'm exaggerating, of course, but that would throw off all your hole measurements if you tried to measure the locations of these holes, especially if you did it from one side to the other. So it's not always practical. I, I, will, I will give you that. I don't usually do it. I usually, um, if it's a really tight tolerance, I will. If it's not super tight, but there is true position, what I'll usually try to do is verify some perpendicularity of the faces with my indicator. I'll sweep a, a pin through the holes on both sides and look for a difference. And if I see a, a giant difference, I'll know there's a problem. But if there's no big difference, typically I'll leave it alone and I'll do the rest of my work uh, with a height gauge. So, um, you know, if you're not sure, you know, if this is still a little confusing to you, um, it takes some practice to understand. It takes a few parts being bad to really see the issue. And when you're dealing with kind of nice finished parts like this one, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to always see and understand. So hopefully, you know, you've got good parts. You don't need to worry about this. But when you see, you know, ABC, maybe a tight tolerance, think about getting your, your, your primary datum registered first on three points and then your secondary datum on two and your last datum on one. Now, here's a, a few rule of thumbs. Um, you know, datums are ideal references or perfect zeros, but the truth of the matter is you're picking a surface and surfaces are never perfect. So that can sometimes throw off your, your readings. Sometimes the machining process or the production process leaves surfaces very rough, um, in bad flatness, in bad cylindricity or circularity. And you gotta live with that, you gotta use that. Now sometimes when you're using, when you're using B blocks, when you're using surface plates, if you remember from the surface plate videos, you know, you are, you are going to kind of average out, well, more like pick up the high points. You're going to miss all that chatter. So that, that in one way that helps you uh, with your measurements because you're not getting a lot of noise. But on the other hand, you're either missing some noise that might be a problem for the part or uh, maybe the part's kind of rocking and not stable because it's so twisted or has burrs or some, some other issue. So keep that in mind, datums are never perfect. Uh, I like, you know, I, I try not to take anything for granted just because it's a datum on the print and you're supposed to treat it, you know, treat your inspection like this is a perfect zero. In reality, the part is not perfect and can throw off some of your measurements. So just remember that. And also remember, as I mentioned before, uh, control frames override those basic tolerances so a rectangular zone becomes a circle, um, a waviness restricted to a flat or a parallel section. A taper or a skew can be restricted to, you know, on, a, on, a, on an angle, can be restricted to perpendicular. Or a size and a position can be restricted to a certain zone for size and position. And as I said before, GDNT is frequently abused and misunderstood and lack of training 
and enforcement of standard practices. Now you may take, you may watch this video, you may learn something from it, and then you go out to somebody else and, and you know, you, you try to work with them and, and they've had some other experience in their career and you might, you guys might disagree. So uh, just be prepared for that and just use your head. Think about what, you know, take the, whatever training you've had, whatever references you may have looked at, people you trust, you know, people that you think are doing a good job with these symbols and, and, and inspection in general, you know, ask them what they think. Now I'm gonna we're gonna run through a few examples of the prints that I have on the website. So uh, just very quickly, just so we uh, when we go to start using the the surface plate tools and the hand tools, we'll know what we're looking at. So this is kind of what they look like. You have a perpendicularity on this face, perpendicular to B. Uh, I don't have the datums highlighted, but datum B is down here. So if this surface needs to be perpendicular, then that's basically just a 90 degree angle. You have a flatness on A surface, just three thousandths. Uh, you have a parallelism to B over here. Again, datum B is down here. So we'll do parallelism there. We've talked about this true position a little bit. There's a cylindricity here. So that's a form error, how round that hole needs to be. And angularity. So, you know, we've defined an angle at 40 degrees. It's pretty much angularity is just like perpendicularity, just at a different angle. For this shaft here, uh, we have a straightness requirement on this diameter. We have a circularity and a runout requirement here. And we have a cylindricity and a total runout requirement here on this diameter. And again, this is referencing data may. You know, runout symbols require uh, a reference to a datum. And form errors like these do not require. And then here's this flange we're going to be looking at. So parallel to A, you know, A is this backside, which has a, a flatness of three, or sorry, flatness of two requirement. Then we have an internal diameter, uh, which is a datum B. This is that symbol. I told you I would, I would stop and, and show you guys another way a datum symbol can be applied. Rather than, you know, it's hard to attach, or it actually it looks pretty bad to attach that dark triangle to this surface. So a lot of times for diameters, they'll just attach a leader and put a datum inside of a bracket like this or, or some other way. But this has a, a form error of two thousandths. This one has a form error of three thousandths and a run out of three thousandths relative to B. And then we have a run out of five thousandths relative to B. So we will um, kind of take this step by step. We're gonna look at the form errors first. I like to start with those because they just deal with the size of something and the shape of something. And I like to know that before I go and do the location. A lot of times you need to know the size before you can do the location anyway. So it helps to, to already have that information. Ah, just looking for something. Okay, so uh, you already highlighted these. We have a uh, cylindricity of the hole. We have a flatness of the backside. Um, we get to use our our, our lovely jacks, if you remember those videos. Um, and then we have a straightness on this diameter for the, for the shaft, and we have a circularity and a run out uh, for another diameter. Sorry, just we're just gonna focus on form error. So um, let's just get started. Uh, grab those prints if you have them handy, because I am just gonna get going reading my own print. So let's start off with the angle block. And we have a cylindricity of 10 thousandths and a 970 through all requirement. So this is a pretty open tolerance. And this is probably a little bit redundant, but let's talk about, you know, what does this mean? This means I have a tolerance zone minus 5 thousandths and plus 5 thousandths. So overall, that's 10 thousandth zone. So that, um, that might look like, uh, why don't we go back to the PowerPoint real quick. Very beginning. So that might look like, you know, from here I can go 970 is my nominal. I can go 975, 
for 965. Overall, that's a 10,000th zone. So, now it's just a question of how do we measure this, right? We've already, we've done a video on how to inspect holes. Uh, some of the tools, you know, think back at what tools can we use? We can use caliper, we use a hole mic, telescope gauge, uh, a CMM. A small hole gauge is probably not big enough for this. Um, so those are those are some good choices. A, uh, a hole mic, uh, a caliper, uh, a telescope gauge, and you're going to make your choice based on a tolerance. So it was kind of a large tolerance. It was ten thousandths. So um, I feel confident using my caliper for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look 970 ish, yeah, 970. And we're looking for our min and our max. Oops, that can't be right. There we go. 967. So it's a little out of round. And I'm sorry. Nine sixty nine, so nine sixty seven was our smallest, and I'll go to the back side and try to grab onto it. Nine sixty eight, nine sixty nine. So I think our, our largest was nine seventy that we got on the front somewhere. Actually, now I'm not. Eh, I could probably get it if I keep looking. Nine seventy there. So 967 to 960, sorry, to 970. Uh, 967 to 970 is three thousandths. So what I would conclude is I have three thousandths of cylindricity error, which is within the spec. And for the 970 um, requirement, I can go from that to 965 based on the cylindricity requirement. So I'm within spec at all, at all cases. Both, both the size and the form error requirement have passed, whether I use a caliper or a hole mic. Now, typically you're gonna get tighter tolerances than this, and you're gonna to need to use a hole mic, most likely, or a CMM, maybe even a telescope gauge if you're good with those. Next up, uh, let's do the flatness requirement. So there's a flatness of data may, uh, three thousandths. Data may is the backside. So we get to use my favorite tool. I say sarcastically because I keep struggling with them on the video. But let's give this a shot. So I'm gonna flatten those out. And if you haven't seen me do this before, go ahead and check out the surface plate video. But I'm just, oop, I am just setting my jacks. Um, I'm going the wrong way. Just trying to get my, my jacks to uh, relatively the same spot before I put the part on. Get these out of the way. That might help. All right. Maybe a little bit more. So I think they're pretty much at the same level, give or take. Now we're gonna be jacking it up from the face that is not the datum so that we can run the indicator across the datum. So I'll be picking three points. Let's try to space them out so that it's evenly balanced. And just grab a marker. So once I define zero at those three points, I'll be able to take my flatness reading. Zero, 
Oh, that's not bad for starting out. Oh, that's really not bad at all. So, let's see if I can do a little better this time than the other videos. And I'm just gonna bump up each jack until it reads zero. Oh, and the part shifted, so that may be a that might cause a problem. But I'll just have to check zero again. All right. Okay, I've got zero there. I need to adjust this one. All right, I've got one last one to adjust, hopefully. Come on, it's always a problem one. Should replace it. All right, zero. Close to zero, a little bit off. All right, zeros. All right, three zeros. So now we're ready to uh, take our take our flatness measurement. So let me swing the camera a little bit. We can see everything. So I've got zero at all locations. I, I do apologize if you didn't see. It was probably just off camera. I was fighting it to get zero at this point, zero at this point, and zero at this point. This is how the three jack level works. And I would, you know, ideally I would like to get them all equally spaced, but this is kind of an unusual shape part. So I think this is good enough to work with. But once we have a three point level, we can sweep the entire surface and we're gonna look for our low and look for our high. So right now I'm seeing a low of one half and a high of one half. pretty much all I'm seeing. And this is pretty consistent with the last time I measured this on camera. So I'm seeing about one thousandth of form error, which we call flatness. And according to our print, we had three thousandths, so this part passes. Uh, the other way you can do a flatness check, this is the recommended way to do an official check. If you need to do a quicker Kind of a dirtier check. Uh, you'll take your, your surface and flip it over. Get rid of you guys. And what you'll do is you'll grab, uh, you'll rest the surface, uh, the datum on a surface plate, and you'll grab your smallest shim and you'll try to slide it underneath and then work your way up. So when your when your smallest shim goes under, you'll know the gap is bigger than that. And you just keep going up until the shim doesn't go. But at this point, because I've already measured it at 1,000, I have a one and a, th one and a half thousandth shim. I'm, I shouldn't be able to get this in from anywhere. So that's kind of a quick check, but um, it works when you have a little more open tolerance and larger parts it's good for. So we're going to move on. The, the other form errors we had, if we take a look at take a look at uh, PM-01 and the straightness requirement and the circularity requirement. So the straightness requirement is on this surface and it's basically saying we just need to make sure it's not in an arc shape or a wavy shape or anything else. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna zero our indicator on the high point. So I'm gonna sweep through. And I, I covered this in the surface plate video, if you, if you haven't seen it yet, um, on how we do this and why. And then we're gonna sweep multiple places and look for an issue. So, I should mention, this is one of those cases where a datum is not required. I have a straightness of two thousandths, but I do have a datum diameter uh, here and here. So, 
I am going to be resting it on the V blocks on that datum diameter to, to simulate what the print wants. This goes into one of those gray areas and how do you set it up and um, it will affect, right? We're, we're, we're checking with our datums, kind of orienting the part, orienting how it's supposed to be, but we're gonna maybe see some error relative to how it's supposed to be. Even though there's no datum requirement on the print, it makes the most sense. And I bring that up because right now what I'm seeing is a taper. So I go from zero on this side and I go about minus one on this side. So how do I verify? I'm gonna rotate it about 90 degrees or so and just keep checking. Pretty much zero there and a little small there. So I have a taper and I would say we have a straightness issue of one thousandths. However, some people might interpret this as saying, well, it's, it's a straight cone. It's not a bending cone. It's not a wavy cone. It's a straight cone. There's no datum requirement. But it's probably not what, what they want. Because whatever is registering here, there may be a gap. If there's a, if, if there's a taper, there's still a high point and a low point, And there may be some sort of gap that they don't want, which is uh, what they're controlling. Now, 1,000th is within our tolerance. So we're still good. The next up is a little bit tricky, the circularity symbol. Uh, circularity is a two-dimensional requirement. And what that's going to mean is, instead of checking the whole diameter, that would be a cylindricity check if we did that, uh, which is what we're gonna do next. You know what, why don't I do the cylindricity check first and then we'll explain the, the other one. So I'm gonna do a cylindricity check right now on the, on the end piece the 0.508 diameter. I'm gonna have to move some things around. All right, and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna do a zero, and we're gonna zero there. Oh, got a lot of chatter on this thing. Tons of chatter on this end. It may have been sitting in the lathe so I'm seeing like plus two and it's just due to the chatter. And now what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is kind of a run out check. Actually, I got ahead of myself. I am doing the run out check. Um, to do the, I got, I, I got completely ahead of myself. So uh, just ignore what I was saying for about the last minute. And let's, let's start over with this um, cylindricity check. This cylindricity check of five thousandths means that cylinder um, variation needs to be within five thousandths from min to max. So just like I did with the hole, I'm now working with a shaft. And so to verify that, I think five thousandths is an appropriate tolerance for, for micrometer. So let's check our zero. Zero's looking pretty good. Now let's check our 508 at multiple locations. So, what do we have here? Oh, I have 517. Well, that's not within five thousandths. And here I have 516 and 514 and there's a lot of chatter on this thing so 517 i'm not even reading off them i'm rounding off basically 513 so my high and my low was 513 and 517 my low and my high so my cylindricity error is that min and max difference so it's four thousandths however it passed the requirement for the cylindricity, uh, but it did not pass the 508 diameter. So it's, it's straight enough, but it's not the right size. So that is gonna be a problem for this part. 
Now, what I was kind of getting, when I was getting ahead of myself, sometimes when you're working with a diameter, it will be the perfect size all the way around, and it'll be bent, like in an arc shape, like a donut. Well, it won't be that exaggerated, but it'll be bent in an arc shape. So it's the constant diameter, but it's not straight, and that will also fail. Uh, if it's wobbling out of the tolerance zone because it's not straight. So that's why I set up my indicator to run a quick check and look for whether or not it's it's bent. So I'm gonna zero it. So I've got it on zero. I'm gonna rotate this around and there's a lot of chatter but there's not a whole lot of movement. It doesn't appear to be bent. I'll check closer to the base. Now it's a different diameter, but it doesn't appear to be bent. If it were bent, it would be flying all over the place. So I think my last measurement with the micrometer is, is valid. It's a large diameter, but it's relatively straight. And we're going to wrap this up with the last call out, circularity. Now because circularity is not the same as cylindricity, cylindricity is three-dimensional and I checked everywhere on the print. Circularity is two dimensional, so it's actually gonna have a location. If you notice, there's a 2.5 location from datum B. So how we do that, one of the easiest ways is grab a caliper um, and you could either set it on a Joe block, that's a 2.5. I am just, because we're you know in training, I'm going to set this at 2.5 myself. I really do recommend you get a Joe block when you are going to do this, but um, because this, this, this part's a little misshapen, I'm going to mark this um, with, a, with a Sharpie, and then we'll, we'll do our, our check where the Sharpie is. All right. So this is kind of a rough check, but it is hard. You know, without a CMM, it can be hard to, to exactly get 2.5. Now, you can set up layout tools and you can scribe it. Um, you could, you know, use the height gauge. Um, but for what we're doing, I want a circularity of 3 at this spot. And it's supposed to be 1.012. So I'm going to be using my, my, my micrometer again. I only have three thousandths of circularity, which is why I'm going to be using my micrometer and not my caliper. So I'm going to aim for my black spot and take my readings there. So I'm reading uh, just a little bit under 1.012, maybe 1.0, sorry, yeah, 1.0118. And then I'm going to rock it around and, and keep checking around. Uh, a same reading basically. I'm going to go one more rotation and I've got the same reading. So there's only one or two tenths of error in that cylinder circularity requirement. So our error was say 0 0.0002 and our size was dead on for the requirement of 1.012. So Two different requirements, right? The size and the shape of the of the diameter. We, we, we verified both at the same time. So we're coming up on about an hour into this video. I'm gonna take a quick break and continue on with the next video. Thank you.